Good afternoon. I hope your stomachs are full. Hope you don't fall asleep because that post-lunch lull. Um, uh, yes, I'm Laura Edwards. I'm um, just a little background about myself. I'm a PhD candidate in educational administrations and uh, foundations, but I'm also academic advisor and I direct two study abroads um, and I'm a lecturer in French and Italian at my at Illinois State University. Um, aside from my own personal L2 experience abroad, I became interested in this because my own students were returning less proficient than I would have expected and, um, and they uh, were having difficulty rating at advanced low, which is the requirement at our university for teacher ed education. Um, and uh, so I, I guess I came to the realization as I started reading that students study abroad for different reasons and even with specific um, with goal, even with specific goals, they make inconsistent and intercultural uh, and linguistic gains. Um, as I looked into it further, I found that previous research shows that uh, motivation is affected by many um, different factors, which I don't have to tell all of you. Um, program length, living arrangements, identity, social networks, and so on. Um, I also found that L2 identity research refers to the destabilizing effect of study abroad requiring negotiation of identity to influence an identity of proficiency. And uh, that the quantity and quality of L2 contact with members of the local community um, may affect the L2 acquisition abroad. And um, Trentman said that students may make greater strides in L2 acquisition when the group that they're part of uh, creates a feeling of common meaning and purpose, giving them the confidence to use the L2 in real situations. So in light of this, I took it an interest in groups and I found communities of practice, um, a group of people who collectively learn through taking part in a shared endeavor. And communities of practice need uh, three basic themes uh, in order to, according to Leibman Wenger, be a community of practice, mutual engagement, a group together, joint enterprise where they have a common goal, and shared repertoire, tools, words, gestures that give meaning to the group. Um, and uh, Wenger says that this is, gives them an identity of participation. When participants feel invested in a community of practice, it becomes a part of who they are and um, allows their practice to be an investment in learning. So LPP, legitimate peripheral participation, uh, is the process of newcomers becoming a member in, of a COP. This theory, as probably many of you know, came from Wenger Life's time in uh, West Africa where they were observing Taylor apprenticeships and they noticed that these um, novices in tailoring uh, learned through a comprehensive understanding of the whole person as opposed to just rote learning and they called this situated learning. Um, so LPP is a newcomer who kind of stands on the periphery and learns to talk from this periphery about and within through an exchange of info about this community as part of movement toward becoming full member. Um, I believe that Trentman is next door and uh, she, her uh, study on three specific uh, COP LPPs in Egypt uh, was a very interesting one that showed the positive outcome of um, having a dedicated language learner LPP or COP. So I use these perspectives to inform how study abroad students might construct a positive L2 identity through LPP and then um, as they become members of a COP abroad. Um, I'm going to talk about the case of one student and um, for it I ask the question, how did this student negotiate his L2 identity through LPP within a community of practice? Um, so the participant's name is Chev. He was 22 years old, an undergrad French ed major, major a native English speaker, and he spent his, the spring semester of his junior year in Angers in France at CDEF, which is a program for L2 um, learners of French. The participants of the, uh, the CDEF were majority Chinese American and Japanese, 
I ask this question because I, at first I thought, and I think this is still true, that it was mostly Americans hanging out with each other and that affects um, their uh, motivation to um, speak something other than English. Um, Chev took part in two COPs. The first one was in a local gaming club called La Sympathique Société Ludique. He informed me that this is called Warhammer Battle in France and Fantasy in the United States. This gaming club had 30, around 30 members. And the second COP uh, was with Chev's host dad, Jean, who we think was, um, is a widower. Neither Chev's host dad nor the members of the club could speak much English, so all interactions took place in French. Okay, data collection analysis. Um, four recorded semi-structured interviews that, um, between me and Chev, pre-departure, midterm, upon his return, and then a three-month follow-up after he returned. It was either over the phone or in person. Uh, the first two interviews were divided into an English and French portion for an in-house proficiency assessment. And then the return interview was conducted entirely in French. The three-month follow-up was in English. Chev wrote two long journals kind of later on um, during his time, maybe in about May, and 14 weekly quantitative sur surveys that he followed up with uh, a few journals, kind of emails to me where he was expanding on these quantitative surveys. Um, when I, when we had the midterm interview, I called him on the phone and his host dad answered. And so he and I ended up talking. So, and, and Jean, his host dad, told me about his perception of Chev's behavior, um, his L2 acquisition, and Jean's expectations of foreign students who live with him. He does this every semester. Um, Chev also completed a pre-departure, midterm, and return proficiency self evaluation kind of quantitative thing. Um, he had an unofficial OPI pre-departure. He, he rated close to intermediate high. And then um, upon his return, he had an official OPI and rated at advanced low. How did Chev negotiate his identity? Um, in the first COP um, in the gaming community, um, I really found that he followed these steps that um, are kind of shown within this description of LPP. He proactively searched for the gaming community even when he was still here in the US. So before he left, he searched and found a forum online, um, found out about meeting times in Angers, the town where he spent the um, semester abroad. He introduced himself and interacted online before arriving. And then when he got there, he initially visited um, the gaming community. He told me it wasn't far from where I lived and uh, that he noticed that uh, people spoke entirely in French, slang that he did not know at all, um, and so he really felt like a novice based on this. He said, um, I'm a little overwhelmed because where have I learned to, whereas I've learned to speak, certainly I haven't learned to communicate, at least to me, all the little phrases and quirks and lingo, which is difficult to get when you're sitting in a class talking about history. This communication problem here makes me feel that it sets the men from the boys. Um, so he got into this routine of going to the uh, gaming place, and he told me um, he told me that he was going pretty often. So I said, "What do you do when you get there? Tell me what happens when you get there." He said, "The daily routine was like I would just show up, and I would be just content to walk around and watch other people play stuff for like two hours, and then finally they'd be somebody would be like, "Hey, we're starting something. Do you want to join?" Okay. Um, and through this, he starts to notice some acceptance from others. And uh, another time he arrived, he brought his own game and waited for other gamers to invite him. Finally, a gamer who'd brought copies of the rule book asked Chev to play a game with him, during which they had a playful exchange that gave him a feeling of belonging. He said, like one game I played and he crushed me, and it was like this hilariously bad defeat for me. But we just kind of joked about it, and I was like, oh man, I suck. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> um, so this shared repertoire of words, I followed up with this, how did you say I suck? And he said, um, je, and I said, je suis nul, I'm useless or terrible. He said, yeah, like nul, or I said, the big thing I picked up from them was like, if you want to be really French, you say putain, F word, a bunch. 
the biggest phrase I always remember is like, j'ai envie d'un six, ah putain, cinq, I want a six, oh F, five, like that. And that was the most of it, so you just kind of picked that up. Um, continued shared repertoire with words. Um, he recognizes then that he has ability to talk within and about his gaming practice. I asked if he felt that using this language made him feel like his French was more authentic, and his response was, um, yeah, I think so. It means that you're like actively joining a community. How did he know to say that? And just observing via like a uh, textbook. Um, rules. Uh, one of the gamers gifted Chev with that, the gaming rule book I referred to earlier. Chev had wanted it so bad, but it was 80 euro. Um, he saw this, the gift of this rule book as his acceptance, not only into the group, but also into French society. He said, it was really heartfelt kind of expression to me. Coming a couple times, being so inclusionary, like they have an internet forum that you post like, hey, I'm showing up today. And so everyone had been so inclusionary on the forum. And like when you got there, it was like, oh, you're the American, what's up? And finally, some guy being like, hey, you've only shown up here like four times, but here's this thing. And so, yeah, I don't know if it overall reflected my experience in France, but it was definitely, to me, like a watershed moment where I could just transition from someone who was just visiting to, like, someone who was staying. And then gestures. Um, Chev found himself more integrated because of his inclusion in meaningful common gestures. So he says to me, this is um, between him and me. Oh, did I ever tell you about the really cool thing about it? This is a cultural thing. When you walked in there, you had to shake hands with every person. I said, OK, like greeting every person. So if there were 30 people, you were shaking hands with 30 people. He said, unless the guys looked really busy in their thing. But even then, if you walked up to their table, they'd be like, oh, bonsoir. And you'd be like, and I said, at least you make a connection if it's not physical. He said, yeah, so you'd be playing a game, and people would come in, and they'd just shake your and that was the nice thing, because like even at that point, I was established a little bit as an outsider, but still like people, and I said, you're part of, and he said, I wasn't like separated. I said, that's cool. Did you feel that being a part of that made you more Angevin, like a citizen of Angers? He said, gave you a little sense, a little bit of a sense of regularity, because you have your hosts and the kids you hung out with at school. And then like the only French people you ever try to interact with are people you're trying to get services from. So this was like a nice type of like, this is what it would be like if I really lived here. OK, COP number two, host father, Jean, and follows these same rules that I was referring to, a little bit shorter, though. Um, focusing on Chev's arrival, Jean setting rules and routine, Jean introducing him to friends and uh, community, and Chev realizing maybe that he's no longer so much of a foreigner. So when he arrived, Chev was doub doubly affected by both the language barrier and these rules that he didn't really get yet. Um, and he said, so he said to me about this, did I ever tell you the first time I arrived there and I got to his apartment and he has a no shoes in his apartment rule, which I totally understand. He's very up about his apartment. I laughed with him about this story toward the end because I'd never admitted it to him for the longest time. But the first time we got there, I didn't speak a lot of French. I was jet lagged and I was like, ah, oh, bad an internet, that's all I want. So we get to the door and he's like pointing at my feet and being like, obviously, I know now he's saying, enlève les chaussures, like enlève tes chaussures. But I'm like, I'm looking and he like opens the door and I start to walk in. And he's like, no, chef, est-ce que tu peux enlever les chaussures? And I'm like, take my shoes off? And he's like, yeah. I just didn't know what to, I was like, ah. So I thought that was hilarious. By midterm, Chev said he spent the majority of my time with my host dad. And he told me they had this daily routine. He found that uh, Jean really liked the free newspaper that he was able to get at school. And he would bring the newspaper home from school, give it to Jean. Jean would prepare dinner. Chev would go in his room, go on the internet and chill, talk to his friends or whatever. And then they would meet and have dinner, watch TV. A lot of times there were those political shows like Les Guignols. Um, and then they would get into discussions about all sorts of things, usually political, cultural. Jean would actually fall asleep in his chair 
And so I said, wow, Jean fell asleep in his chair. It must mean you guys were pretty comfortable with each other. And Chev said, yeah, I followed all of his rooms, I th rules. I think he was pretty happy about that. In the midterm interview with Chev, when I talked with Jean, Jean referred to the fact that Chev was learning all of the rules. So um, Chev's negotiation of rules and acceptance of them allowed him and Jean mutual recognition of this host family COP and gave Chev an identity of participation um, in which he defines and reifies himself through this mutual engagement. Um, Jean helped Chev navigate life in France and with all sorts of things. He helped him find a bike place where he could rent his bike for free. He told him about bike paths around that um, you know only local people would know about. He took him on visits. He introduced him to his French friends. And so I asked him, how did your connection to Jean affect your assimilation into French culture and life in France? He said, I think it was nice because he just helped expose you to a lot more things, like French people too. I met Michel and Martine, I met his boss Marc and Sabine who lived in the same hotel. I know a couple times he like found brochures for me. He drove me around. Honestly, I'm happy he took me to Flunch, a French fast food restaurant. I thought it was funny. I thought it was a jokey little routine and I loved every part of it. So in a previous interview, Chev said, I can't help but feel like the wacky foreigner when I speak French. That was probably around midterm. So I asked him in the three-month follow-up interview if his interactional, interactional learning with his host father and friends affected this feeling. He said, it's just probably like I'm somewhat unremarkable, but not a French person. Several ticks before, Andy Kaufman was the wacky foreigner. So I just felt like, well, Andy Kaufman was just like new goofy idioms and said things occasionally. And people would be like, ugh, him. But now it's, I feel like if I went back, it would be just, it would just be like I could integrate fairly quickly. So these findings explain how these concepts can allow for um, confidence and positive L2 identity during study abroad. Chev's gradual assimilation into two meaningful COPs may have had an effect on his L2 learning. Um, while OPI outcomes show positive gains, more in-depth assessment would be needed. Chev transitioned from newcomer, novice, through observation and gradual participation to one who is confident about how to speak and live among the French rather than remaining on the periphery. And as we heard from several of his remarks, he notes the expendability of in-classroom information compared to the significant meaning and real-world usefulness of the outcomes of his group connections. So I think Chev was an anomaly. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. Most students just aren't as forthcoming as Chev, and, he would, um, and they would be too reticent to approach a community in the way he did with this gaming community. Um, it would just take them too far outside of their comfort zone, and actually many participants I've had since then, that's been the case. Uh, many students would have a difficult time with such a demanding host that had so many rules, and that would um, affect um, they're gaining any learning of substance like Chev did. While it seems evident that COPs are a very effective way in which students abroad can flourish, we have to realize that it's not easy to approach new situations. Um, in some cases, faculty members travel along with their students and are there sur place to introduce them to these opportunities, um, but that's not always feasible either. So, um, yeah, this is, these bring about important implications about how we can prepare students for their study abroad, um, how to maximize their exposure to meaningful real life interactions and not perpetuate the students abroad as tourist stereotype that seems to have taken over a lot of programs. Um, through analysis of Chev's positive experience, using these perspectives, and by understanding what affects second language identity, future students can be counseled and encouraged to take um, to make these contexts, and researchers can develop future programs that includes these components to enhance the experience so that study abroad can provide opportunities to socialize and learn in greater depth. I made it 20 minutes, huh? Okay.